Book Three, Part One of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso, translated by Brooks Moore. Book Three, Part One. Now Jupiter had not revealed himself nor laid aside the semblance of a bull, until they stood upon the plains of Crete. But, not aware of this, her father bade her brother Cadmus search through all the world until he found his sister, and proclaimed him doomed to exile if, if he found her not. Thus was he good and wicked in one deed. When he had vainly wandered over the earth, for who can fathom the deceits of Jove, Cadmus, the son of Agenor, shunned his country and his father's mighty wrath. But he consulted the famed oracle of Phoebus, and inquired of them what land might offer him a refuge and a home. And Phoebus answered him, When on the plains a heifer that has never known the yoke shall cross thy path, go thou with her, and follow where she leads, and when she lies to rest herself upon the meadow green, there shalt thou stop, as it will be a sign for thee to build upon that plain the wells of a great city, and its name shall be the city of Boeotia. Cadmus turned, but hardly had descended from the cave, Castalian, ere he saw a heifer go unguarded, gentle-paced, without the scars of labour on her neck. He followed close upon her steps, and silently adored celestial Phoebus, author of his way, till over the channel that Sophisus wears he forded to the fields of Panope, and even over to Boeotia. There stood the slow-paced heifer, and she raised her forehead, broad with shapely horns, towards heaven and as she filled the air with lowing, stretched her side upon the tender grass, and turned her gaze on him who followed in her path. Cadmus gave thanks and kissed the foreign soil, and offered salutation to the fields and unexplored hills. Then he prepared to make large sacrifice to Jupiter, and ordered slaves to seek the living springs whose waters in libation might be poured. There was an ancient grove, whose branching trees had never known the desecrating axe, where hidden in the undergrowth a cave, with osiers bending round its low-formed arch, was hollowed in the jutting rocks. Deep found in the dark centre of that hallowed grove, beneath its arched roof a beauteous stream of water welled serene. Its gloom concealed a dragon, sacred to the warlike Mars, crested and gorgeous with redescent scales, and eyes that sparkled as the glow of coals. A deadly venom had puffed up his bulk, and from his jaws he darted forth three tongues, and in a triple row his sharp teeth stood. Now those who ventured of the Tyrian race, misfortuned followers of Cadmus, took the path that led them to this grove, and when they cast down splashing in the springs an urn, the hidden dragon stretched his azure head out from the cavern's gloom and vented forth terrific hissings. Horrified they dropped their urns. A sudden trembling shook their knees, and their life-blood was ice within their veins. The dragon wreathed his scales in rolling knots, and with a spring, entwisted in great folds, reared up his bulk beyond the middle rings, high in the air from whence was given his gaze the extreme confines of the grove below. A size prodigious, his enormous bulk, if seen extended where was naught to hide, would rival in its length the serpent's folds, involved betwixt the plains of the twin bears. The terrified Phoenicians, whether armed for conflict, or in flight precipitate, or whether held incapable from fear, he seized with sudden rage, stung them to death, or crushed them in the grasp of crushing folds, or blasted with the poison of his breath. High in the heavens the sun small shadow made, when Cadmus, wondering what detained his men, prepared to follow them. Clothed in a skin torn from a lion, he was armed, complete, with lance of glittering steel, and with a dart, but passing these he had a dauntless soul. When he explored the grove and there beheld the lifeless bodies, and above them stretched the vast victorious dragon licking up the blood that issued from their ghastly wounds, his red tongues dripping gore, then Cadmus, filled with rage and grief, Behold, my faithful ones, I will avenge your deaths, or I will share it. He spoke, and lifted up a millstone huge in his right hand, and having poised it, hurled with a tremendous effort, dealing such a blow would crush the strongest builded walls. Yet neither did the dragon flinch the shock, nor was he wounded, 
for his armour scales fixed in his hard and swarthy hide repelled the dreadful impact not the javelin thus so surely by his armoured skin was foiled for through the middle segment of his spine the steel point pierced and sank beneath the flesh deep in his entrails writhing in great pain he turned his head upon its bleeding back twisting the shaft with force prodigious shook it back and forth and wrenched it from the wound with difficulty wrenched it but the steel remained securely fastened in his bones such agony but made increase of rage his throat was swollen with great knotted veins a white froth gathered on his poisonous jaws the earth resounded with his rasping scales he breathed upon the grass a pestilence steaming mephitic from his stygian mouth his body writhes up in tremendous guise his folds now straighter than a beam untwist he rushes forward on his vengeful foe his great breast crushing the deep-rooted trees small space gave cadmus to the dragon's rage for by the lion's spoil he stood the shock and thrusting in his adversary's jaws the trusted lance gave check his mad career wild in his rage the dragon bit the steel and fixed his teeth on the keen biting point out from his poisoned palate streams of gore spouted and stained the green with sanguine spray yet slight the wound for he recoiled in time and drew his wounded body from the spear by shrinking from the sharp steel saved his throat a mortal wound but cadmus as he pressed the spear point deeper in the serpent's throat pursued him till an oak tree barred the way to this he fixed the dragon through the neck the stout trunk bending with the monster's weight groaned at the lashing of his serpent tail while the brave victor gazed upon the bulk enormous of his vanquished foe a voice was heard from whence was difficult to know but surely heard son of agenor why art thou here standing by this carcass worm for others shall behold thy body changed into a serpent terrified amazed he lost his colour and his self-control his hair stood upright from the dreadful fright but lo the hero's watchful deity minerva from the upper realms of air appeared before him she commanded him to sow the dragon's teeth in mellowed soil from which might spring another race of men and he obeyed and as he ploughed the land took care to scatter in the furrowed soil the dragon's teeth a seed to raise up man tis marvellous but true when this was done the clods began to move a spear point first appeared above the furrows followed next by helmet covered heads nodding their cones their shoulders breasts and arms weighted with spears and largely grew the shielded crop of men so it is in the joyful theatres when the gay curtains rolling from the floor are upward drawn until the scene is shown it seems as if the figures rise to view first we behold their faces then we see their bodies and their forms by slow degrees appear before us on the painted cloth cadmus affrighted by this host prepared to arm for his defence but one of those from earth requested cried arm not away from civil wars and with his trench and sword he smote an earth-born brother hand to hand even as the vanquished so the victor fell pierced by a dart some distant brother hurled and likewise he who cast that dart was slain both breathing forth their lives upon the air so briefly theirs expired together all as if demented leaped in sudden rage each on the other dealing mutual wounds so having lived the space allotted them the youthful warriors perished as they smote the earth their blood-stained mother with their breasts and only five of all the troop remained of whom echion by minerva warned called on his brothers to give up the fight and cast his arms away in pledge of faith when cadmus exiled from sidonia's gates builded the city by apollo named these five were trusted comrades in his toil now thebes is founded who can deem thy days unhappy in thine exile cadmus thou the son-in-law of mars and venus thou whose glorious wife has borne to thine embrace daughters and sons and thy grandchildren join around thee almost grown to man's estate nor should we say he leads a happy life till after death the funeral rites are paid thy grandson cadmus was the first to cast thy dear felicity in sorrow's gloom oh it was pitiful to witness him his horns outbranching from his forehead chased by dogs that panted for their master's blood if thou shouldst well inquire it will be shown his sorrow was the crime of fortune not his guilt for who maintains mistakes are crimes 
Upon a mountain stained with slaughtered game, the young Hyantian stood. Already day, increasing to meridian, made decrease the flitting shadows, and the hot sun shone betwixt extremes an equal distance. Such the hour, when speaking to his fellow friends, the while they wandered by those lonely haunts, Acteon of Hyantis kindly thus. Our nets and steel are stained with slaughtered game. The day has filled its complement of sport. Now, when Aurora in her saffron car brings back the light of day, we may again repair to haunts of sport. Now Phoebus hangs in middle sky, cleaving the fields with heat. Enough of toil, take down the knotted nets. All did as he commanded, and they sought their needed rest. There is a valley called Gargaphia, sacred to Diana, dense with pine trees and the pointed cypress, where, deep in the woods that fringed the valley's edge, was hollowed in frail sandstone and the soft white pumice of the hills an arch, so true it seemed the art of man, for nature's touch ingenious had so fairly wrought the stone, making the entrance of a grotto cool. Upon the right a limpid fountain ran, and babbled, as its lucid channel spread into a clear pool edged with tender grass. Here, when awearied with exciting sport, the sylvan goddess loved to come and bathe her virgin beauty in the crystal pool. After Diana entered with her nymphs, she gave her javelin, quiver, and her bows to one accustomed to the care of arms. She gave her mantle to another nymph, who stood near by her as she took it off. Two others loosed the sandals from her feet. But Kokali, the daughter of Ismenus, more skilful than her sisters, gathered up the goddess scattered tresses in a knot. Her own were loosely wantoned on the breeze. Then in their ample urns dipped up the wave and poured it forth. The cloud nymph Nephele, the nymph of crystal pools called Hyale, the raindrop Rhanis, Psychus of the Jews, and Phyale the guardian of their urns. And while they bathed Diana in their streams, Acteon, wandering through the unknown woods, entered the precincts of that sacred grove, with steps uncertain wandered he as fate directed, for his sport must wait till morn. Soon as he entered where the clear springs welled, or trickled from the grotto's walls, the nymphs, now ready for the bath, beheld the man, smote on their breasts, and made the woods resound, suddenly shrieking. Quickly gathered they to shield Diana with their naked forms, but she stood head and shoulders taller than her guards, as clouds bright tinted by the slanting sun, or purple dyed aurora, so appeared Diana's countenance when she was seen. Oh, how she wished her arrows were at hand! But only having water, this she took and dashed it on his manly countenance, and sprinkled with the avenging stream his hair, and said these words, presage of future woe. Go tell it, if your tongue can tell the tale. Your bold eyes saw me stripped of all my robes. No more she threatened, but she fixed the horns of a great stag firm on his sprinkled brows. She lengthened out his neck, she made his ears sharp at the top, she changed his hands and feet, made long legs of his arms, and covered him with dappled hair. His courage turned to fear. The brave son of Autonoe took to flight, and marvelled that he sped so swiftly on. He saw his horns reflected in a stream, and would have said, Ah, wretched me! But now he had no voice, and he could only groan. Large tears ran trickling down his face, transformed in every feature. Yet, as clear remained his understanding, and he wondered what he should attempt to do. Should he return to his ancestral palace, or plunge deep in vast vacuities of forest wilds? Fear made him hesitate to trust the woods, and shame deterred him from his homeward way. While doubting thus, his dogs espied him there. First Blackfoot and the sharp-nosed Tracer raised the signal, Tracer of the Nossian breed, and Blackfoot of the Spartan. Swift as wind the others followed. Latin, Quicksight, Shawfoot, three dogs of Arcady, then valiant Kilbuck, Tempest, fierce Hunter, and the rapid Wingfoot, sharp-scented Chaser, and Wood Ranger, wounded so lately by a wild boar, savage Wildwood, the wolf begot with Shepherdess the cow-dog, and ravenous Harpy followed by her twin whelps, and thin-girt Laden chosen from Sicionia, Racer and Barker, brindled Spot and Tiger, Sturdy old stout, and white-haired blanche, and black smut, lusty big lacon, trusty storm and quickfoot, active young wolfet, and her Cyprian brother, black-headed snap, blazed with a patch of white hair from forehead to his muzzle, swarthy blackcoat, and shaggy bristle, 
Towser and Wildtooth, his sire of Dicte and his dam of Lacon, and yelping babbler, these and others, more than patience leads us to recount or name, all eager for their prey the pack surmounts rocks, cliffs, and crags, precipitous, where paths are steep, where roads are none. He flies by routes so oft pursued, but now, alas, his flight is from his own. He would have cried, Behold, your master, it is I, Acteon. Words refused his will. The yelping pack pressed on. First black mane seized and tore his master's back, savage the next. Then rover's teeth were clinched deep in his shoulder. These, though tardy out, cut through a by-path, and arriving first, clung to their master till the pack came up. The whole pack fastened on their master's flesh, till place was none for others. Groaning he made frightful sounds, that not the human voice could utter, nor the stag, and filled the hills with dismal moans, and as a suppliant fell down to the ground upon his trembling knees, and turned his stricken eyes on his own dogs, entreating them to spare him from their fangs. But his companions, witless of his plight, urged on the swift pack with their hunting cries. They sought Acteon, and they vainly called, Acteon, hi, Acteon, just as though he was away from them. Each time they called he turned his head, and when they chided him, whose indolence denied the joys of sport, how much he wished an indolent desire had happily held him from his ravenous pack. Oh, how much better tis to see the hunt, and the fierce dogs, than feel their savage deeds! They gathered round him, and they fixed their snouts deep in his flesh, tore him to pieces, he whose features only as a stag appeared. Tis said, Diana's fury raged with none abatement, till the torn flesh ceased to live. End of Book 3, Part 1